This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the Holistic Survival Show with Jason Hartman. The economic storm brewing around the world is set to spill into all aspects of our lives. Are you prepared? Where are you going to turn for the critical life skills necessary to survive and prosper? The Holistic Survival Show is your family's insurance for a better life. Jason will teach you to think independently, to understand threats, and how to create the ultimate action plan. Sudden change or worst case scenario, you'll be ready. Welcome to Holistic Survival, your key resource for protecting the people, places, and profits you care about in uncertain times. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Jason Hartman. Hey, it's my pleasure to welcome a returning guest and a good buddy of mine, Mark Moss, back to the show. And he's been doing a lot lately on his channel, talking about three big cycles that are converging and what this means to all of us. We also, time permitting, might get a chance to talk about how he's applying the old refi till you die idea that I've talked to you about many times over the years to a different asset class. Mark, welcome back. How you doing? Yeah, thanks so much, Jason. Uh, Yeah, I love always being back with you and hanging out and talking. Well, it's always great to have you. And you are coming to us from Puerto Rico, right? That's right. I'm in uh, sunny Puerto Rico. It's been, uh, I've been here for five months now. It took a little bit of adjustment to get here, but um, we're finally slowing down, living that island vibe. So it's been pretty cool. Well, one thing we know for sure, Mark, you are paying the lowest taxes of probably, well, certainly anybody in this conversation, but uh, probably anybody listening or watching anywhere in the world, your tax rate in Puerto Rico is so, so desirable. It's just fantastic. So it is. Enjoy that. I built my I built my kind of investing career off of a theory that uh, thesis is that uh, money goes where it's treated best. Yeah, and so I've always I've always thought about that every time I go into an investment. Like, is this where my money is going to be treated best? You know, and, and, a, and a balance of risk and return and all those things. Now it's just kind of like, is this where I'm being treated best? And so I was living in California. I know you used to live in California. It's a great place to live. And it's worth it's worth a lot of money to live there, but how much? Yeah, right? it, it is. At a certain has, point, it just gets to be too expensive. <laughs> and you know, it was one of the one of the strictest states in the nation for lockdowns. Yeah. And so you start to look at all those factors. Money is one of, of many factors, but you look at you know what are you paying out? You have the highest homelessness rate, one of the worst school districts. You know, you're getting no return on that investment. You were locked down. You know, strictest lockdown laws. Not just the highest taxes, almost double the second highest taxes. Oh yeah. And then you're getting no return at it. And so it's just like, shoot, is this really where we need to be? And um, schools were shut down. There's no schools. (laughs) They were doing school online. So we figured, Hey, why not? Let's go give it a shot. And so we're, we've been living the Caribbean lifestyle. Yeah. Good for you. Good for you. You know, Mark, I actually want to run something by you on that note, because um, when we really started with these lockdowns and quarantines just over a year ago, I said something, I made a prediction on my show and I kind of think you'll agree with this because you, you sort of just alluded to it. Since 2012, because of, you know, emerging technology of self-driving cars and autonomous vehicles, right? I said, geography is less meaningful than it's ever been in human history. I still think that's true now because of COVID and the adoption of Zoom and all of that it has even made it Well, less meaningful in the sense that you don't have to be in a high density urban environment. That's always historically been the trend, right? That you had to be in a city so that you could make connections and make money and have jobs and all that kind of stuff. That's no longer true. But, you know, a big part of real estate valuation, and it's totally dysfunctional, right? It shouldn't be this way, but that's the way the whole thing evolved, is school districts, And now we have, to some extent, decoupled from the idea of school districts. Think about it. It, You know, you can attend school on Zoom. Who cares where you live or what your district is? Like, that's just an absurd idea now, right? 
Definitely. Um, to your point, I mean, that's definitely a big cycle uh, that I've been observing and, and I've been calling it kind of the great migration. I was looking at it. I've been looking at it for years, looking at demographic trends, right? And baby boomers. Um, but now the pandemic has just accelerated that because it forced everyone to work from home. And so yeah. companies that thought they could never allow their employees to work from home, or people thought they could never work from home, all of a sudden were forced to, and they found out that they can. Same with the school as well. And so, and I think that's why we see areas booming like Wyoming or Montana that you would never expect. And that's because people could finally go wherever they want to live. Right. Yeah, they could. They could. So does that play into one of these three big trends you're talking about? Well, no, not necessarily. Um, if anybody's watched my channel, I always like to try to pull like historical references in. It was probably the one subject I really liked in school uh, growing up. And, and uh, I love history. I love how history, you know, Mark Twain said it doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And there's just so much to learn from that. And, and unfortunately, so much we're going to have to relearn if we ignore it. But what's interesting is when you look through history, you can see cycles that just tend to kind of repeat over and over and over. And so um, I think it's important to kind of go back and look at those and then understand these cycles and, and, and bring them forward. And I like to like break things down super basic and um, maybe down to what you would call like first principles or like natural laws. And so we have like natural laws, like gravity. <laughs> gravity is a natural law and, and that you can't break that. You can, uh, with enough money and technology, you can kind of bend it but you're always going to have to adhere to that law. No matter how rich you are, uh, if you fall off a cliff, you're going to die. And so gravity is always going to be there. And so some of the laws are like sowing and reaping. You must sow before you reap. You must produce right. before you consume. I mean, that's just a law. There's no way around that. And so we look at some of those things. Also, um, we can see, you know, summer, spring, winter, fall. That's a natural phenomenon, right? We have these cycles, summer and winter, boom and bust, you know, all those types of things. And so those are um, cycles that repeat. There are other things. And so sometimes humans think that things are very linear. And I know you talk about linear and cyclical markets a lot. And so it's kind of like that. We have linear trends that keep progressing or we have cyclical ones that kind of start, start and stop, start and stop. But also there's exponential and so um, like technology isn't linear. Technology is right. exponential, for example. Human progress is not linear. Human progress is exponential. So anyway, there's a lot here. And I'm not going to go super deep to get it all confusing. But, you know, you have four-year presidential cycles and you have eight-year business cycles and 80-year credit cycles and 250-year revolutionary cycles and all these types of things. And what I've done is I've tried to break them down into three categories, and so looking at cycles in a kind of a political sense, political cycles, social cycles, looking at cycles in an economic sense, and looking at cycles in a technological sense. So there's a bunch of different cycles, but breaking them into those three buckets. So political, you know, societal, economic, and technological. So there's a bunch of cycles that fit within those. And so I think Starting kind of at the um, societal one, political one, if you will, you and I were talking uh, before offline about like the book, The Fourth Turning, right? And so that kind of covers one. It's like an 80-year cycle. They call it like a saculum. It's kind of like a life cycle of a person. Right. It's broken into four 20-year segments. And again, it's summer, spring, winter, fall, right? It's You go through that whole cycle and people might know this one. They might've heard like um, hard times create strong men. Mm-hmm because people have to rise to the occasion, but For those sure. strong men create great times. Yeah. And then those great times create weak men. And those weak men create bad times. And then bad times create strong men. And you kind of you right. repeat yeah. that over and over and over. So that's kind of one example. What's interesting about that from a kind of societal political standpoint is that if you look at kind of like where we're at today, back to a natural law, which is you must produce before you consume. All of nature knows that to be true. The ant stores up for the winter, right? The bear gathers and sleeps with the winter, right? We all know that the lion has to be faster than the slowest gazelle or it's going to die. Or the gazelle has to be faster than the lion or it dies. Right. But we have this interesting period where strong men created great times and that great times created like this massive storehold of capital, of wealth. And today we're seeing, you know, second generations, you know, academia and politics, they've never produced in their life. And it's completely distorted their view of the world and how the world works. Like there's natural law and we always must adhere to it. And so they've been allowed to distort that reality, but it's always going to come back and bite them. 
Right, right. Yeah. Well, the problem is they're living off the production of other people, right? Exactly. And I hate to get political. Well, actually, I like to, but there's that old story you mentioned, uh, the ant, right? There's that yeah. story about the ant and the grasshopper that I'm, sh I'm sure you know. When you look at like these professors or these college students that don't live in the real world, and I mean that by professor saying they, they basically work 12 hours a week and they live in an ivory tower. It's a womb. It's insulated from real world forces. So they have tenure. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's just not the real world. Right. Right. And so we've got so many people living off the efforts of other people. And I remember another meme that went around the Internet. You know, a lot of these memes just sum up things in really short sound bites. And it talked about how Democrats cannot live without Republicans, but Republicans could live very nicely without Democrats. Now, I don't know that's totally true because most of the Democrats produce the movies and the art and the music, and I like all that stuff. But mostly the Republicans are the people who are just working. They're like a lot of blue collar people and a lot of small business owners, right? So you're right. You have to sow before you can reap. You have to put in the wood before you can get the heat from the fireplace. Absolutely. Yeah. And there, yeah. there are timeless wisdom on that, you know, from the Bible onward. But, yeah. you know, the problem is when you have like half the population that gets the same vote and they don't work and the other half works and they get to vote the treasury of the other half in their favor, right? What do yeah. you do? Well, what's interesting, um, kind of looking at that cycle back to that kind of fourth turning cycle. And the way that I look at these cycles is that um, the way that I look at looking like kind of macroeconomics no one indicator is conclusive, right? So I like I to look for a yeah. bunch of indicators that line up. And so I know there's probably a lot of people rolling their eyes and all oh, that for turning, that doesn't mean anything. Okay. And, and by itself, it might not, but we can layer on a couple other things. But one thing that's interesting about that is uh, Lenin's quote that, you know, there's decades where nothing happens and then days where decades seem to happen. And so in that fourth turning, the world is ripe for change. And so that fourth turning is that decade or the, where days are like decades happening. And so um, I think we'll see massive change and so then um, that kind of brings me to like another cycle that I've been watching, one that I really like. I've done a video about it about a year ago. I did a video on this one and it's another 80 year cycle. And the reason why 80 year cycles are kind of powerful is because that's like that life cycle, that li like lifetime cycle. But basically the world swings from a, a we, which is a collectivism or globalism, centralization. And then the world swings like a pendulum back to uh, me or individualism or decentralization. And so um, that's an 80 year cycle. So 80 years ago before now was the end of World War II. And so we saw the UN was formed, the IMF was formed, the Bretton Woods monetary system was formed. Right. And so all that was formed. And now here we are today at what we might consider peak globalization, the World Economic Forum, the World Trade Organization, the World Health Organization, the World Meteorological <laughs> Organization. And the Great Reset. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the yeah. UN, IMF, et cetera. And so we're probably at peak globalization, but we're seeing that the world's rejecting that, right? We have massive populist uprisings across the world P before the pandemic. And a lot of people maybe aren't aware of this, but before the pandemic, broke out, there was about eight countries with about a million people each in the streets marching. And then it just disappeared overnight when the pandemic broke out. But we can see how, it how convenient for those yeah. who might be uh, who might have an interest in the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, for <laughs> sure. For sure. That's it's another almost, rabbit hole. <laughs> it, it, was, it was definitely a rabbit hole. And you could yeah. see, I mean, just just I mean, eight countries. I mean, Hong Kong was obviously big, big and Chile and Lebanon and Argentina and, and on and on and on. But we can still see it today. I mean, we the news censors it quite a bit. But on Twitter and things, you can see it. Um, the Netherlands and the UK. I mean, there was a million people marching in the UK, I think, a week ago anti-lockdowns and things like that. I mean, Brexit, Donald Trump, those are all symbols of the world rejecting the establishment, that centralization. And so the world wants to start moving back. So we kind of have this, this fourth turning, which is kind of like, uh, you know, natural law has been suspended, right? They, people haven't been producing. Um, it, the good times have brought upon weak men with bad times. But at the same time, we're peak globalization and the world's rejecting that and is ready to swing back towards a decentralization. And then you have the, you know, we can look at the economic side which is kind of like the Ray Dalio's like credit cycle. And so we can see that governments can continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger, but at some point there's maximum credit out there. So interest rates have been brought all the way down to zero. We went from, you know, 15% in the eighties to zero today. And the, and the fed has two tools at their disposal, interest rates and debt. That's what they have. 
and interest rates are at zero and debt's at 30 trillion, I mean, 300 trillion globally. So like, what do you really do? And if, if you and I were playing a board game, Scrabble or whatever game we might have, at some point you run out of moves. And then what do you do? You have to reset the game, right? <laughs> That's the right. only option. So like, that's like it from an economic side. So we can see it from, we can see from like a societal p- political side, you know, fourth turning pendulum swinging from an economic side, we can see the credit cycle is maxed out. Ray Dalio has been talking about that quite a bit. Um, but the third one that most people I think have not been paying attention to is the technological cycles. And that's where I think it gets really interesting. So we already know in the fourth turning, we have the maximum amount of change happening in this, in this last you know, kind of decade, this last 10-year period. We know that the world is rejecting globalization and is going to start moving back, but now we layer on technology. And so there's been um, five technological revolutions in the last 250 years. I'm not talking about technologies. I'm talking about technological revolutions. I'm talking about something that was so revolutionary, it changed all of humanity forever. Mm-hmm. And so the 1700s, the mid 1700s was the industrial revolution, right? And that changed the face of humanity. It brought people from the fields and it created factories and towns and all those things. It was a massive shift to humanity. Then fast forwarding, we had the steam engine and steel. And I mean, think about that. All of humanity, they made bricks with mud, <laughs> And now all of a sudden we had steel and what, what did steel allow us to do? Build skyscrapers and giant bridges and ships and like on and on and on. I mean, steel, it's hard to imagine how much steel has really changed the world. Steam engines as well. We could now move stuff across distances, across land and all those things. Then we had electricity, right? That's a, that's a revolution. I mean, people lived in darkness for, for, for all of eternity. And now all of a sudden there was electricity, which of course wasn't just about light, Electricity allows us to do this Zoom call right now. I mean, electricity was everything, right? Then we had the automobile. That was in the early 1900s. And of course, for all of humanity, people walked and rode horses and now they could ride. And they, they, yeah. could, they, they could add trucks and they could ship stuff and they had farm equipment and all that stuff. Fast forward into 1970s. You, you, know, you, know what, you know what's interesting, Mark? I keep thinking as you're talking about these different technological revolutions, what if the uh, folks running the consumer price index hedonically indexed all of that? They would think everything is like given to us for free nowadays and everything costs nothing. <laughs> Because of technology advancing and like progress belongs to the people, not the CPI. You know, that's what I always say. So yeah. that's, it's interesting. Well, that, that's actually a great point. And we could just talk about that for a second. So another thing about natural law and about human nature is ingenuity. I believe in abundance. Uh, everything in the world. I mean, we, everyone, everyone lived in dirt a thousand years ago or, uh, you know, a couple hundred years ago. The whole world was dirt. Everything we have in the world was created. And there's no limit to the amount of creation we can have as long as we have our creativity. But what happens is it's also deflationary. And so I used to carry one stick at a time. And then I decided that I would invent a wheelbarrow Mm -hmm. that made work easier. We used to have a dream of growing up and having a robot clean our house. So I didn't have to spend hours cleaning house. That's deflationary. I used to have a wall full of $25 DVDs and now for five bucks, I just stream as many as I want. Sure. Yeah. Um, I used to have to fly to Florida to see you to do this interview. And now yeah. I can do it over Zoom. Right. And so that's all deflationary. And people have been taught to think that's a bad thing, but it's actually a good thing. Like, for example, coffee used to be 10 cents and then 20 cents and then 30 cents and then 80 cents. And now it's three bucks. Do you think that with all the technology and steam engines and everything that we have today, that isn't it? cheaper and easier to get coffee to the store? Yeah. Shouldn't coffee have gone down, not up? And so while people have been brainwashed to think that deflation is a bad thing, the reality is that we should be, it should be easier for us to survive today, not harder. Right. In, you know, pre-1971, it took about 23 weeks of work hours for the average American to have the American dream, the house, the cars, you know, the family, et cetera. Today, it takes 53 weeks it should have gotten easier. Now, mm-hmm. We should be working less. Right. And that's a whole other rabbit hole to go down. So, of course, uh, there's tax and monetary and fiscal policy in there that have changed everything. I mean, if you just go back to the 50s or even, you know, some part of the 60s, it was a single income and a family of four and a house on a quarter acre lot. Now, granted, the square footage of the house was smaller and it maybe only had one bathroom, 
but it's really arguable. This stuff is really, it gets complicated because there's a massive amount of time scarcity nowadays, and that's been going on for a long time. Many futurists predicted in the early 70s that technology would make it possible for us to just work one, two, maybe three days a week, and now people are working seven days a week. Technology is intrusive, though, right? It, well, it, but it blurs it's, it's, the line. It's not the technology. So again, back to this interview, if, if I would have had to travel to you by foot, how long would this interview have taken me? If I can travel right. by car, how long does it take me? If I can travel by plane, if I can travel by Zoom. So me doing this interview with you by foot versus me doing it by Zoom, I've cut out weeks of travel, right? I've cut out weeks. Here's the problem, Jason. The problem is that we've built our entire world on a fiat money standard, which is inflationary. Right. So the Fed and the inflationary monetary system is completely at odds against natural law. Sure. Natural law is deflationary. The Fed is trying to create inflationary. They're battling nature. And of course, we know who will always win in the end is, is nature. So Mark, let me just express that the way I've said that for years, right? I say it a little differently than you, but I think we're kind of getting to the same point. I, I do it as a, a war or a boxing match. In one corner, you've got bad fiscal and monetary policy. That's inflationary. And in the other corner, you've got technology. That's deflationary, right? Right? Because innovation is inherently deflationary. Right. So, you know, the question is, who will win? The problem is technology ultimately is unlimited, but it does take steps to evolve, right? You know, we, each technology builds on a prior technology sure. most of the time. There are some times that they don't, but mostly they build. But bad fiscal and monetary policy, they can just keep printing. And last year, we saw that more than any other year. But they, but they can't forever. Right. They can't forever. And that's where, again, I can suspend gravity for so long, but I'm always going to be bound by it. When is the jig up? When does that, you know, in well, essence, it's a Ponzi scheme, right? You know, do they just have to call it quits? Yeah. Well, that's where I, that's where I think this, these three cycles converging really shows us some clarity to that, right? So we had societally, right, with the fourth turning, it, it looks like we're in that fourth 20-year period, right, where we're going to see massive change happen in probably the next decade. On top of that, we have that pendulum swinging, which is the world peak globalization and switching back to decentralization or individualism. We have the economic cycles that are ending, but now back to the third one, which is this technological cycle. In 1971, we had the, the microprocessor, which was a massive shift for humanity. And now we have computers so we can do this. Um, and if you kept track, it'd be about every 50 to 60 years, we've had one of these revolutions. So 1971 till today, 50 years, and we have a brand new technological revolution happening. And what's interesting about this technological revolution that we have happening is it completely coincides back with our political societal cycle, which is the world going from decentralization to centralization. And now the world wants to swing back to decentralization. At the same time, we have a brand new technological revolution of decentralized technology. And so now we have a technology coming on board to aid and speed up that change, that natural cycle at the same time as a fourth turning where there's massive change happening all at the same time. So when you layer all those on together, you have a catalyst for enormous change. And so I think it, you know, within the next five years, we're seeing fireworks, right? It's all happening right now before us. And I think it's, I think it's pretty evident to anybody paying attention that there's massive growing pains. I mean, the world is, there's a massive collision that's happening. They're trying to suspend, you know, natural law that, you know, it's going to come to a head. Uh, we have obviously political factions disagreeing. We have worldviews disagreeing. Income inequality is higher than it's ever been, all these things. And so the change is here. I mean, over the next couple of years, this is all coming to a head, in my opinion. Okay, so what's going to happen? Tell us what that looks like. And then, of course, the million dollar question is, what should we all do about it? The technological revolution, the decentralized technological revolution that I'm talking about is Bitcoin. All right. And so Bitcoin is more than money. Um, what happens is as human beings, we're very poor at seeing the future. So what we can do is we can imagine a better version of what we have today, but we can't imagine something new. So for example, um, we have cars, well, flying cars. I could send a mail, now I can send an electronic mail. But we'd never imagine that our cars would be hooked to something called a cloud using something called social media to like navigate us around traffic because we didn't have those things. And also what happens as humans is what we try to do is we try to you know, make sense of things. And so Bitcoin, oh, I get it. It's kind of like digital gold. Oh, I get it. It's kind of, it's kind of like, an, like a digital cash. 
oh yeah, it's kind of like a store of value. Well, it's, it's all those things, just like the internet was a way to send electronic messages and the internet was a way to have message boards, but it became so much more. And so uh, we try to understand technology by comparing it to something we have. The problem that I've seen is the more, um, almost maybe the more educated you are, the easier it is for you to dismiss it and overlook it. Oh, oh I, I get it. I get it. It's kind of like that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I yeah. get Yeah, it's like that. It's like, I've been studying it for seven years and I still don't really get exactly where it's going to go, right? We can see some of these massive changes making to the world, but we don't really know how big of an impact that makes over the next hundred years. And so that's really the catalyst. And so back to your question is, what does this mean and what should people be watching and what should be people be doing? Well, we know that there's one part of the world, the, the NGOs, the three-letter organizations, and they have a plan for you, right? <laughs> they have a stated goal, right? And, and by 2030, you own nothing and be happy. Right. That's their goal. Their goal is to have complete enslavement. And I, and I hate to use that word. I just don't know what else to say. I mean, through the central bank digital currencies that they're rolling out, that's the perfect surveillance and control tool. So central bank digital currencies are a tool of control. It's programmable money. So they could say, hey, Jason, if you don't spend your stimulus by Friday, it comes back to us. Right. Or if, if you I, don't but, spend it in a certain neighborhood or between the hours where we have curfew, you can't spend it. Yeah. You know, the, the money just turns off and on based yep. on where you're located or based on time. So, Mark, they can basically do what economists talk about all the time. They can really manipulate the velocity of money, can't they? Well, they can certainly try. And, and not only is it programmable, like you've just said, which are, which are great insights, Jason, but they can also use it for behavioral modification. So for Scary. example, yeah. hey, Jason, you're saving way too much money. So you're negative 5% interest. Hey, Mark, you're not saving enough. You get a positive 10% interest. They could do it for certain minority groups or ethnic groups. Like for example, they've been talking about reparations for a long time. So let's just give money to there or just this area. So like behavioral, if you do these things, if you take the vaccine, you get this stimulus or, so there's all types of things that they can program into that. Now it is kind of that, like you said, that back to that perfect tool, the economists have always wanted, but the piece that. Oh, I, I'm not saying that in a good way. No, I know. <laughs> this, I know you're not central, saying This is a central planner's dream. It's terrible for the people. It is, right? They want to take more control of our lives. Now we're already starting to see talks that, you know, they want to limit beef or outlaw beef and they want to limit travel all named to save the climate and whatnot. You know, like I said, the World Economic Forum, these, these are stated goals. This is not like some conspiracy. This is this is publicly yeah, on their website. Just, just go look on their website. You know, right. it's, it's amazing. So, like I remember um, a friend of mine was starting to argue with me on Facebook about the Bill Gates thing, right? And the farmland and, uh, you know, all of this stuff. It's not like a conspiracy theory that Gates wants to reduce the population. The words have come out of his own mouth. I've seen the videos. You know, people try to marginalize some of these ideas as though there's some wacko conspiracy theory. They're right out there in the open most of the time. <laughs> yeah, and and people will defend his motive for saying those right. things, but you can't defend you can't defend the fact that he did say them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And so 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 anyway, we we see that right. We see those people have said those things, and we can see that's the goal with the central bank digital currencies. We know we know where that's going. You know, China with their social credit score system and all those things. We can see that that's the direction the world's going. But at the same time, we also, uh, if you can understand, kind of the more basic principles, you understand those, those things will always fail. You can't just print unlimited money. Money does not equal wealth. Wealth is goods and services. They can print as much money as they want, but if there's no goods and services to spend those, that money on, there's no wealth. And so we know that system will, will fail. And, and, and by, the way, by the way, Mark, you know everybody gets it. They know what you're talking about. But if for those who want to split hairs over semantics, really what Mark's saying is currency being different than money, sure. right? You know, money, like the implied idea is it has intrinsic value. A currency is just fiat. It's just fake. Well, Jason, I would say that there's no such thing as intrinsic value. Mm. All value is subjective. Now we talk about real estate a lot and all everything subjective is relative to what all value is subjective. So for example, you know, Peter Schiff says that, well, gold has intrinsic value. No, all value is subjective. All value is implied. So uh, our good buddy, George Gammon kind of uses this argument, but if we were on a stranded on Island, you and I, and we had a case full of gold bars, yeah. there's no value with those gold bars. There's right. no value. If I had a billion dollars of currency, there's no value of that. So there's no value in gold. Now, water, for example, 
or food. Last night went out to eat. I threw my leftovers away. Those leftovers had no value to me. But if you and I were on a stranded island, that was all the food in the world. I would give every single penny I had for that. Right. Food. Yeah. So all value is always subjective based off of that situation. So there's no such thing as intrinsic value in my opinion. Even a house, for example, I mean, sure, it's it's real. I could touch it. I could always live in it. But there could be situations where uh, houses are actually an albatross around your neck. I mean, I went into Indiana and they were literally paying people to take houses and, and remodel them. They needed to get rid of them. They were eyesores. They were drink, bringing the economy down, right? Oil during the pandemic in March last year, oil went to negative that. $35 oh. a barrel. Negative. They had to pay people to take the oil. Yeah. Everything would be subjective, at least in my opinion. I don't know. Which, which interestingly, by the way, go back to a comment you said earlier, Mark, about interest rates, right? Interest rates are basically at zero. And for some people in some places, they're actually technically negative. Like you have to pay a bank to store yeah. your money for you. Isn't that yeah. weird? Which yeah, through through Europe and I think and maybe it was Germany, um, some of the big banks there, they won't even take your cash deposits now. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. Or they'll hit you with that negative interest rate. So um, yeah, that's pretty amazing. So we see that it's all happening, but at the same time, it's starting to fail. We can see the cracks. We see the populist uprising. We see the changes here. And so we know that something big is going to happen. I am in the camp that I believe that humanity, human ingenuity, humans drive for freedom and liberty will always succeed in the long run. History shows us that over and over. I believe that we've been given a technology that has this decentralization, and I believe that decentralizing things is, is the answer. So if we look at the founding of the United States, which was the greatest experiment ever in the history of mankind, it was founded as a decentralized government. Right. All 50 states were, well, there wasn't 50 at the time, but all 50 states were supposed to be independent and sovereign. Yeah. As a representative republic, not a democracy. Yeah. That, that, that's correct. Right. And so, and they got that from the Roman Republic before it became the empire and collapsed. And so we can see that, you know, 330 million people in the United States is way too many people to be represented by one person. Right. It's just, it's just not, doesn't work. I think that's the trend that the world will go. Um, it's not going to be a smooth transition. And so um, back to what should people be watching? What should people be doing? I would say that I'm a surfer. You know that I travel all over the world chasing big waves. I might see a big storm in the South Pacific that's going to send some big waves to an island and I might book a trip to go there. While people there might be freaking out and booking right. trips to get off the island. Right, so right. it really comes down to like, do you see the storm? Do you know how to navigate it correctly? And so if you play this transition properly, you could come out ahead. It could be very, mm -hmm. very good for you. Unfortunately, for most people who don't know what they're looking at and don't navigate this correctly, it could be catastrophic for them. And so the first thing is to be paying attention to, to your show and podcast like this and be paying attention. But I think it's pretty simple, not easy, but simple. Um, the goal is to be able to retain your purchasing power, right? You need right. to be able to store your value because when markets crash, that's how wealth gets transferred, right? In the 2008 great financial crash, if you could have retained your wealth and bought back into the market in 2009, 10 or 11, yeah. you would have made enormous wealth. Right. The problem is most people got wiped out from the top and they weren't able to do that. And so that's the example. We want to be able to put ourselves in a position where we can store that wealth. So then we can grab into uh, Harry Dent calls the sale of a lifetime mm -hmm. on the back end. And so if you think of things in terms of purchasing power, how do I increase or maintain my purchasing power into the future? I think it gives you a little bit of a different mindset in order to do that. Okay. So maintaining purchasing power. So I know you're probably going to promote Bitcoin as a way to do that, but you know, well, it's nobody, one of many. It's one yeah, of many yeah, ways. Well, sure. it, that's what I was going to say. And so for diversification, what about, and by the way, I've got my, now this is ironic, Mark. I've got a Bitcoin here. For those yeah. of you watching this on video, you can see me holding it up. But what's interesting about this is this is real because it's an object, right? But it's fake. Yeah. <laughs> it's a real fake Bitcoin. Yeah. You know, that that's the irony because Bitcoin is only digital. This is a tangible object, you know? There's a transition and obviously the younger generation doesn't really distinguish between digital and real. It's just everything's real. You know, digital is real. Older right. generations have a harder time grasping that. But I think, um, you know, obviously you're a real estate guy. I've been a real estate investor for 25 years. That's one option, right? So right now, real estate is preserving your purchasing power compared to holding dollars. 
That's the whole point, right? Yeah. Dollars are losing purchasing power. If you put $100,000 in the bank 10 years ago, today that $100,000 probably buys you about $60,000 worth of goods. Yeah, is it, bought- isn't that scary? That is just so, that's why they call inflation the robber and the thief, you know? Right, yeah. yeah. And if, if you would have put that $100,000 into a home 10 years ago, now you'd be able to buy more things with that right. money today, right? And so, so real estate's one way. I, I, what I like to do is I like to tell people that um, they need to invest. I like to call it like your investor DNA. So whatever you have interest in, whatever you feel comfortable with, whatever you know interests you, excites you, that's the best way to go. So I have a good buddy and he, he's made a lot of money in real estate, loves real estate, and that's what he feels comfortable with. And so I'm like, dude, you're doing really good with it. You know, Stay there. So some people may not be comfortable with gold. Some people may not be comfortable with Bitcoin and that's okay. There's other options. Um, now, some things are going to store value better than others. And then some things have other features. So for example, real estate's great because it provides cash flow. And cash flow is a super important piece because as this transition happens, you want to make sure you have income coming in so you're not pulling down or drawing against your uh, store value. So I love real estate for that play. I also think that in this power struggle over the next couple of years, we're going to see the governments around the world, especially the Federal Reserve, print more money than we might have ever even imagined. I was just adding it up on a video I was just doing. Between the Fed and the government, the U.S. government, it was $8 trillion in the last year. Uh, plus, plus and, and, what Biden, and you're saying it could be even worse than that, even more? Uh, I mean, well, staggering. plus what Biden's already committed just in the first 100 days, it's up to $12 trillion. Wow. That, that's half of this, GDP. This is unbelievable. And so yeah. like, I wouldn't be surprised to see it be 20 trillion or 30 trillion, you know? And so when that happens, you know, kind of like Weimar Republic, I did this interesting video about the Weimar Republic. And so when they print that money, you know, asset prices just start shooting sky high. What was interesting, I pulled a quote from the book or a saying, a thing from the book. And they said that during that time, people in Germany thought they were getting rich. Their real estate yeah. had never been worth more. Right. Their gold had never been worth more. I'm Little cashing out. Yeah. I'm cashing out before the market drops. Right. So they traded all their assets for currency that then became worthless, which was pretty interesting. And so when people see real estate going sky high or gold going sky high or Bitcoin going sky high, it doesn't mean now is the time to cash out. It probably tells you there's a problem with the currency. And so I think rather than going back to currency like they did in Weimar Republic and end up with worthless nothing, uh, you want to hang on to those assets. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, so so hang on to the assets because the currency value is declining. Preserve purchasing power. Is there anything you want to say, Mark, on the societal or cultural side or any more about money, too, and you know, lifestyle, standard of living? Well, um, the other thing that I would say, and and this is unfortunate, but um, back to the societal kind of political side, there's obviously a war on America, and att- I should say an attack on America. Yeah. If you look at, I did a video on uh, the Paris Accord Agreement, and uh, people said, oh, you're an idiot. You don't know anything about science. And I'm like, well, I didn't talk about the science. I was just talking about the actual agreement that was made. And I've done <laughs> tens of millions of dollars of agreements. I know those. What's interesting is like uh, we can see this so so clearly is each country that entered the agreement pledges what they're willing to do. No one's required to do the same thing. Each country just says, here's my contribution. Mm-hmm. And so the United States has already cut carbon emissions by 30%, and they've committed to reduce by another 30%. Now, anybody who's done any kind of performance knows that the first 30% is easier. Yeah, that's that harder next to is do very more. Difficult. Yeah. And so that's a tax on you, right? Your cars got more expensive. Your supplies got more expensive. Your travel got more expensive in order to get those emissions down. Shortages now, of everything. Yeah, yeah and now we're going to cut another 30%. Well, what did uh, India commit to? Well, they committed to cut their emissions as a percentage of GDP. So the catch is, is as long as they grow GDP, they don't ever have to cut emissions. Hmm. And what did China commit to? This is the this is the good part. What did China commit to? They committed to growing their carbon emissions and peaking in the year 2030. And at that point, they would start cutting back. I, I mean, why is it that in every deal, America just seems like the sucker? You know, well, it, like, it's even better than that, Jason. So check this out. So um, in addition to that, mm-hmm. all these countries will have to pay a tax, a carbon tax for these carbon credits. Well, first of all, who are they buying carbon credits from? From the IPCC, Al Gore mm-hmm. and his buddies. Right. Where did they get these carbon credits from? <laughs> mm-hmm. Out of thin air. Right. Why would these countries buy them from them? Well, that gets interesting. So per the agreement, the United States is supposed to put up $100 billion of slush fund money. 
Mm-hmm. That hundred billion dollars is then used to go pay off all the influencers in each country to get them to buy into the agreement. So not only does the United States have to inc- uh, decrease another 30% on top of the 30% they already have, while China gets to increase for the next decade, the United States has to put up all the money to get all the people into it. So talking about taking the short end of the stick, and that's why I don't want to get political on sides left and right. I don't like to attach labels, but it's obvious one side saw that was a raw deal and pulled us out of it. So and, it, and that was Trump, by the way. But, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so my my point is is that um, unfortunately we can see that um, that the U.S. is sort of like under attack. Rather than bring the whole world up, let's just bring the U.S. down. But but, but than, it's uh, not that wa- the U.S. is even under attack. The U.S. is attacking itself. Yeah. Like well, it's the, destroying the, the, the itself. Elite. It's so frustrating. Yeah. So I guess my point that I wanted to make in that, though, sorry to go on that rant, but that's just uh, I would also start to look at money and wealth as global. We talked about one of our other friends who happens to be moving around a lot. And I think that's kind of an approach that you may have to take. Um, and start to think about things globally. I mean, as we started out talking about this with technology, it's allowed everybody to kind of move wherever they right. want. And, um, you know, it's not ideal for everybody and no, and not everybody wants that. I don't even want it personally, but something that everybody should keep their eye on and pay attention to. Great points, Mark. Give out your website or do you want to direct people to your YouTube channel, which is excellent, by the way, uh, or where, where do you want to tell yeah, them? Yeah, the, the, the best place to keep up with me if you want is, uh, is probably one on, on YouTube. I do a couple of videos a week, teaching videos. And so I've kind of pulled out some of these teaching lessons. Uh, so if you, if you like that stuff, you can follow me there. I try to stay away from opinion and everything I do shows a headline, a fact, a chart, or some sort of uh, fact to back that up. Uh, and then I'm pretty active on Twitter as well. So it's just the number one, Mark Moss, number one, Mark Moss on Twitter. Those are probably the two best ways to stay in touch with me. Good stuff. Hey, Mark, it's always just a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah. And let's just shout out to our buddy, George Gammon's conference coming up in Miami. Oh, yes. The Rebel Capitalist Conference. We're both going to be there. Yeah. Um, And so uh, shout that out. If anybody wants to come hang out with both of us, we'll be there. And I'm looking forward to hanging out with you, Jason. I I must say when I was uh, when I was with George over the weekend, I think he might have sold it out. So uh, (laughs) there might be a couple of tickets left, folks. He was able to uh, expand the number of uh, seats because they loosened up on the COVID restrictions. So that was really nice. But it hurry if, uh, if there are any tickets left, uh, or I'm sure there's a wait list. And uh, Mark and I will both be there speaking. So uh, we're looking forward to it. And Mark, I look forward to seeing you then. Thanks so much, Jason. See ya. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, HartmanMedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own, and if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional, and we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.